So by participating in the support group calls, you are acknowledging you understand there are no mental health providers or attorneys on this call and that nothing said here is any way to be interpreted as mental health counseling or legal advice. Now to introduce Dr. Amy Baker. She has been a PhD in developmental psychology from the Teachers College of Columbia University. She is the author or co-author of 10 books and over 120 articles on topics related to parent-child relationships. She offers telephone coaching for targeted parents and can be reached at www.amyjlbaker.com. And I know Amy really does not need, need any introduction. Anybody coming into the, the world of alienation, Amy is the first one that we find. She's done the research for years, and we are so grateful to have her as a presenter. And not only that, we are so grateful for the years of work that she has put in. Um, the first time I ever saw Dr. Baker, she presented at an ISNAF conference back in 2010. She had just published her very first book. Um, and I remember I purchased it and she signed it for me. So um, we're so grateful that she's been able to publish so many more books and articles and she has really made a difference. However, as you all know, we have had progress, but we still have a long way to go. So with that, Dr. Baker, the floor is yours. I will mute myself and then just let me know when you're ready for the questions. Hi, everyone. Um, it's really nice to be here tonight. I want to start by thanking Cindy and the rest of the ISNAP team for inviting me to give this presentation. And I want to thank all of you, the participants. I certainly hope that what I have to share is going to be helpful. My talk tonight is drawn from my latest book, and you can see the copy of it, the cover of the copy right here. The book is entitled Parenting Under Fire. I do want to draw your attention to the subtitle, which is How to Communicate with a Hurt angry, rejecting, distant child. And I imagine that uh, you in the audience can relate to that, that you experience your children as hurt and angry and rejecting and distant. And I do wanna draw your attention to the fact that the first letter of the word hurt is H, the first letter of the word angry is A, and the first letter of the word rejecting is R, and the first letter of the word distant is D. And these letters spell out the word hard. And I did this for a reason. I put these adjectives in this particular order for a reason, which is that these children are hard to deal with. And they are, in some respects, hardened to your love and affection and guidance. And we worry that their lives will be harder if we can't find ways to parent them better while navigating the parental alienation journey. So these are the reasons I decided to focus on hurt, angry, rejecting, distant children for this book. And the reason I wrote another book, and this is my 10th, so you might be wondering, do we really need another Amy Baker book? Um, I did find in my coaching sessions that there were certain parenting principles and certain strategies that I was regularly working on with my clients. And I felt over time that it would be helpful for my current clients and future clients to have this book as a kind of primer before the coaching um, so that we have a common basis of understanding. And it's certainly more efficient for people to read this $30 book than and to get the foundational information that way than to hear it from me in a session. And so what makes the most sense for me is for the coaching then to focus on how to help people apply the strategies in the book. Like, yes, Amy, I read on page 29, the blah, blah strategy, but what do I do when my child does this or that? Um, and of course, there are plenty of people for whom coaching is not in their budget. So writing the book is my way of giving to them what I think of as some of the best and most effective parenting strategies in an easy to obtain format. So Cindy invited me tonight to provide an overview of the book, and that is my intention. Okay, so the book is organized into three main sections. In the first, my co-author and I explore in-the-moment parenting, communicating with a child who is in front of you. So it does presume um, that you do have some contact with your child. In the second section of the book, the focus is on texting, and that might be texting a child who you still have contact with or texting a child from whom you are pretty much cut off from. 
And then the final section of the book is for parents who want to write a letter to an adult alienated child. And I do want to apologize. These are the most boring slides. I recognize that. I used to have a lot of fun coming up with really cool visuals. I just did not have the time to do that this time. So you're just going to see the words on the page. Okay, so with respect to section one of the book, which is topic one, communicating in person, there are four main suggestions that we have. The first is to enhance the attachment. The second is don't take the bait. You've probably all heard me say that before. Foster four values is the third and be a positive parent. So we're going to dig into these. So the first recommendation is to enhance the attachment. And I'm going to talk about this a lot. This means basically turning up the volume on the positive aspects of the relationship. So all relationships are a mix of positive and negative experiences. And it's important that you and your child share positive moments together. These moments hold the relationship together. So it's not enough to just avoid conflict or navigate the challenges, which is important. And that's why it's up there. Um, but there have to be actual moments of love, closeness, and affection between you and your child. That's the goal. And these positive moments help to counter the lie. All alienation efforts are based on a lie. And the lie is that you are unsafe, unloving, and unavailable. So the moments in which your child experiences you as safe, loving, and available helps to counter the lie. So the first specific recommendation for enhancing the attachment is to ensure that all of your interactions with your child are in fact loving. And what we mean by that is that your interactions are loving, so not just with what you do as a parent, but how you do it. This is what matters to the child, and this is what creates a feeling that you are safe, loving, and available. So let's imagine that you have a child who asks you for ice cream for breakfast. Now, you might say, that's ridiculous. Who eats ice cream for breakfast? Or who told you to ask me for ice cream for breakfast? Did your other parent put you up to this? You know that's not what we do. Now, you could talk that way to your child. And of course, it would be appropriate to set the limit and not let your child eat ice cream for breakfast. But how you say no affects the child's experience of the attachment relationship. You could say, that's ridiculous. Who put you up to this? Why would you think that? But if you talk to your child that way, you are conveying that they are stupid or wrong or bad or that they've been manipulated. And nobody likes that. When you talk to your child in a way that makes them feel bad about themselves, you create more hurt feelings. So we believe that children should be free to express all of their wishes, whether it's for ice cream for breakfast or a new puppy or a trip to the moon. They don't understand the ramifications of what they're asking for. So it would not be kind or appropriate or loving to make them feel bad for expressing the wish. So instead of giving them what they want, if you can't, or instead of making them feel badly for asking, what we suggest you do is something called joining the wish. You can say, Oh, man, don't you wish ice cream were a healthy breakfast choice? You can have ice cream later, and now you can choose between pancakes and waffles. You're joining the child in the wish. You're acknowledging that's a lovely wish. You're not humiliating them for asking for ice cream for breakfast. And at the same time, you're setting an appropriate limit. You're not getting out the bowl and ice cream scooper and dishing up Rocky Road for breakfast, but you're saying no in the most loving and non-shaming way possible. Now, as an opposite example, imagine that you want to say yes to your job. Yes, you can have blah, blah. How you say yes still matters, even though you're gratifying their wish. So let's imagine you have a teenager who wants to go to the mall and asks you for money. And you've decided you're going to give them money. You could literally crumple up a $20 bill and say, here, take your stupid money, all right? Or you could hand it to your child with love in your heart 
and say, you know, I've been saving this money. I was thinking about the right time to give it to you. I really feel like today would be a good day. So here's some money. I just want you to have it. In both scenarios, the child's getting the money, but in one, the money is tainted with the parent being unloving, and in the other, the money is enhanced by the parent being loving. So these are just two examples where how you say something matters as much as what you say. And as much as possible, you need to try to be loving in how you speak to your child, always. And again, that does not mean you give them everything they want, and it doesn't mean you agree with everything they say. As a third example, imagine it's 11 o'clock at night, you finally got your kid in bed, you're ready to go to bed yourself, and your child remembers that they need a poster board for school the next day, and they ask you to take you to the store right now to pick it up because the store will be closed or there won't be time in the morning. As the parent, you get to decide whether you want to take your child to the store past their bedtime when you were not really up for going to the store. Most likely, if this is the first time that this kind of thing happened, you're going to do it. And if you choose to take your child to the store past their bedtime when you really don't feel like doing it, please do it with love in your heart. Don't grumble about how inconvenient it is. Don't roll your eyes. Don't huff and puff. Don't lecture your child about how frustrated you are that they didn't remember this earlier. Don't call your name, such as uh, absent-minded or forgetful or something worse. If you do those things, you would be spoiling the experience with negative emotions. If you grumble and complain, most likely that is what your child will remember. At the end of the trip to the store, you might be feeling like a hero. You might think you're the most accommodating parent ever, but your child will remember the way you made them feel when you humiliated them or complained. The child will remember the feeling. So to be clear, if it's truly inconvenient for you, then it's important to think about what lesson you want your child to learn from this experience. And if it is truly inconvenient to go to the store, you could say to your child the next day, again, this is assuming you have agreed to do it, even though it's inconvenient. We do recommend that you say the next day, hey, it was inconvenient for me to have to take you to the store last night. What can we do so this doesn't happen again? Notice the use of the word we. What can we do so this doesn't happen again? That lets the child know that you are on their team, right? You you want the best for them and that you're in it with them. So you're not shaming your child. You're not making them feel bad. We're like, you did this bad thing. You need to fix it. So once you invite your child to think about what could we do so this doesn't happen again, you can then brainstorm with your child some options. Maybe the two of you will decide to post a note on the refrigerator saying, is there anything Jimmy needs to bring to school tomorrow? Perhaps the two of you will decide that you will ask your child when they get home from school, anything we need to pick up at the school at the store for school tomorrow? The solution will depend on the age of your child and how frequently these kinds of things happen. So just to be clear, this is just one example of how to be safe, loving, and available, even when your child is doing something that you might find annoying or inconvenient. Okay, so there are other examples or other recommendations we have all under the concept of enhancing the attachment. So number two, as you can see, is give lots of love and positive attention to your child every day. There's this concept called the magic ratio. There should be about five times as many positive as negatives to a child. This is particularly relevant for, let's say, toddlers who parents end up giving hundreds and hundreds of commands to every day, do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. You want to make sure that you also are giving uh, lots of positive attention, not just directions. Number three is called uh, turning blah moments into ah moments. This is discussed at length in the book, so I'm not going to go into it now because I have to pick and choose 
um, what I'm going to focus on. But the gist of this is that if you're just hanging out with your kid, it's sort of a blah moment, nothing special is happening. There are ways to elevate the moment through loving eye contact, warm facial expressions, positive affirmations, to be conscious of these moments where you're in the same space, how can you elevate them? Speaking your child's love language is also talked about in the book, that there are specific ways that children are more likely to feel loved. Some kids like eye contact, some like gifts, some like acts of service. Try to understand your child and give them love in the ways that feel loving to them. And again, that doesn't mean you give them everything they want. Number five is this thing called show you care packages. This is specifically for kids who are moderately to severely alienated. They come in your door for their parenting time, but they pretty much go right up to their room and you're not going to see them much for the whole visit. So we talk about how to create a package for them, waiting for them in their room to show you care. Point six is to make sure that you avoid bad-mouthing your child to other people, whether it's the school guidance counselor or the parents of their friends. These things come back to your child and they disrupt the attachment. They break the trust between you and your child. And point seven, spend dear time. That stands for drop everything and replenish. That means keeping um, an attunement to your child's emotional needs and being available for them when it looks like they need extra love and attention. So let's turn to topic two of the first section of the book. So the first section of the book is still about managing and communicating with, with your child in person. And this is, so if topic one is enhance the attachment, that's turning up the volume on the positive. Topic two is don't take the bait. This is about focusing on managing conflict and negative emotions in the relationship. So children who are hurt, angry, rejecting, and distant, hard, right, um, often behave very provocatively. They can be uncooperative, negative, contemptuous, surly, and arrogant, and they can really push your buttons. But if you respond with anger or depression, normal human reactions when your child is hurt, angry, rejecting, and distant, you are inadvertently reinforcing in your child's mind the negative idea of who you are, right? And the negative idea is that you're unsafe, unloving, and unavailable. That idea gets reinforced when your child behaves in a provocative way, and then you respond by screaming at or hitting the child or sobbing or saying something unkind. Go, fine, just go and be with that other parent if that's what you want. The child can then say, gee, I guess it's true. This parent is a creep or a monster or a loser doesn't really love me. We don't have any fun together. All we do is fight. So you do not want to inadvertently reinforce that negative idea that the relationship is so bad, the kid should, you know, basically ditch you. As an extreme, imagine that your child accused you of beating them when they were a baby. And let's say you've never hit your child before. You don't know spanking, nothing. But your child's pushing your buttons in your face with very you know, difficult and unpleasant behavior, and then you react by slapping your child. Now you've made the negative idea, you've made the lie come true. All right, so to be clear, children who are hurt, angry, rejecting, and distant with one parent, while not being that way with the other parent, hold their two parents to very different standards. If your child is already hurt, angry, rejecting, and distant with you, then you will be held to a higher standard than the other parent. That is your reality. Is it fair? No. <laughs> but you have to take that reality into account. So you cannot afford to take the bait. The other parent can engage in all sorts of suboptimal and even egregious behavior. But if they're already the preferred parent, your child is going to prefer them pretty much no matter what they do, all right? Your child is going to believe what they say, take their perspective, and see the world through their eyes no matter what that other parent's flaws are. Your child's going to cut that parent all kinds of slack. That parent can miss special events or be ungenerous, 
or dishonest or unkind. They can be mean or lazy, but if they're the preferred parent, your child will minimize and or deny their flaws, and they're not going to cut you any slack whatsoever. You don't have the luxury of taking the bait when your child behaves in a way that you find unpleasant. So the bottom line is that you need to learn what to do when your child is pushing your buttons. So as you can see, there are six specific strategies for doing this that's presented and discussed in detail in the book. The first is to learn how to regulate your emotions so that you don't get flooded with anger or sadness and then do something that you regret. The second is to avoid using negative labels when talking to or about your child. And I would say even thinking about your child. It does not help to think that your child is abusive or toxic or any other negative label because that increases your feelings of distance from your child and your feelings of hopelessness about the situation. Of course, it's important to acknowledge that things aren't going well and that your child is behaving in a way that you find problematic or unpleasant, but the language you use should not exacerbate the situation. The third suggestion is to respond res respectfully, even to unpleasant behavior. And I'm going to give you a specific strategy for doing that in a moment. The fourth is to use what I refer to as the five steps for false allegations, or false accusations. This is a comprehensive approach to responding when your child accuses you of doing something bad that you did not do. You stole my college money. You beat me when I was a baby. You ruined the family. It doesn't matter what it is. It's human nature to want to defend yourself. But as you probably have already found out, that does not work. Your child could accuse you of stealing their money. And even if you showed them proof that the money was still in the bank, it probably would not make a difference. That does not mean that you have to admit you did something you did not do. That is a false dichotomy. You either prove you're innocent or admit you're guilty. There is another way to respond in a very st strategic, thoughtful way. And that's what the five steps is. I've talked about it a lot in other podcasts and web webinars, so I'm not going to go into depth now. But I can tell you, a lot of people have found it very helpful. And it is laid out in detail in the book. The fifth suggestion is to use the modified five steps for when your child accuses you of something you actually did. So let's say you have a 10-year-old who you did slap once when they were five and your child brings it up again. You can't say, I already apologized for that. Why are you bringing it up again? I mean, you can say it, but it won't be helpful. Or you could say, but it won't be helpful. I'm sorry for anything or everything I ever did that you think hurt you. That's probably not going to work. The modified five steps incorporate seven elements of what I consider to be a true and satisfying apology. And again, it's in the book. And the final suggestion here, and then I'm going to go back to number three in some detail, is to avoid doing something that could lead to you having an allegation of child maltreatment. And I'll just tell you a hint here, which is never touch your child when you are angry. Because if you do, you might not know how hard you're touching your child. And you might actually cause some kind of tissue damage, a scrape, a bump, a bruise. And that could lead to an allegation of physical abuse. So if your child, let's just say, hypothetically, doesn't put the cell phone down when you ask them to and it's dinner and they're clutching their phone saying, my other parent gave me this phone. It's my lifeline to them. I'm never giving it to you. You might get your emotions flooded and you might grab the cell phone out of your child's hand. You might scrape them. They might fall over and bump their head and you could potentially have a physical abuse claim against you. So you have to learn about the four types of child maltreatment, physical abuse, sexual abuse, physical neglect, and emotional abuse or psychological maltreatment. And for each of these, there's the very narrow thing 
And then there's a host of behaviors that you might not be aware of actually could get you in trouble with the child protection system. Okay, now I'm going to go back to number three, which is to respond respectfully to unpleasant behavior. You might be wondering, what should you do when your child is behaving in an unpleasant manner? They might be sneering at you, yelling at you, cursing, or engaging in some other behavior that conveys a negative message to you about your worth and value. You're a human being, and you have a right to be respected, to not have anyone treat you in a way that you find very unpleasant. But you cannot, in my opinion, Start with giving your child negative feedback about their behavior, such as how dare you talk to me that way, that's very rude, go to your room, don't come out unless you can be pleasant, that's so disrespectful. Those kinds of responses don't make sense, in my opinion, because if your child is yelling or cursing at you or spitting or doing something else that you find unpleasant, it's most likely because your child is upset with you. And if you start with the negative feedback about their behavior, it's kind of like you're saying, I care more about my feelings than yours. And so in essence, you're reinforcing the idea that you don't really care about them. Therefore, ideally, you will begin your response by acknowledging that your child is upset and by showing that you care. This way, you maintain your position or role as a protector and caretaker of your child. Your empathic response is what creates a feeling of connection. You can address the unpleasant behavior next. So we recommend, and I keep saying we, by by the way, because this book was written by myself and a co-author. All right, so that's where the we comes in. We recommend a three-part response. The first part is to acknowledge that the child is upset. So you could say something like, wow, you're really upset right now, and I want to understand what's going on. Second, you can explain in a non-pejorative, non-blaming, non-shaming way, no labels, no negative labels attached to the behavior. You just describe the behavior that you find unpleasant. You might say something like, you're talking in a tone of voice that's very distracting to me. Or your voice is very loud, it's hurting my ears. Or your cursing doesn't really feel good to me. Or I don't want to be spit at. You're describing something that's uncomfortable or unpleasant for you, but not in a way that is designed to make the child feel bad about themselves. What you want to do is provide neutral feedback, such as I don't want to be cursed at, or I don't want to be yelled at. Then you end this three-part strategy with an invitation to the child to tell you what's going on in a more pleasant way. So here's what the whole thing would sound like. Start to finish using an example of the child yelling. You would say, wow, you're really upset. I want to know what's going on. You're speaking really loudly. The volume's bothering my ears. Could you please say it again in a quieter voice? This strategy is designed to help the child feel that you care about them, that you are safe, that you are loving, and that you're available. This is what can help protect the relationship with the child when your child is coming at you with a lot of anger and hostility. You're providing them also with a wonderful role model about how to talk to other people who might talk to the child in an unpleasant way, right? So not only are you protecting yourself, you're respecting your integrity, you're giving the child negative feedback about their behavior, but you're doing it in a way that enhances the relationship and you're functioning as a role model for your child. Okay. So the next recommendation for parenting in the moment involves instilling and fostering four specific values in your child. These four values are particularly relevant for protecting your child from becoming further hurt, angry, rejecting, and distant. Forgiveness, compassion, integrity, and critical thinking. And in the book, we explain why these values are particularly relevant for parental alienation situations. And for each of these values, 
We teach you how to consciously foster them, how to intentionally foster them in your child. One, by being a role model yourself. You can be forgiving of your child. Another way to do that is praising your child when they naturally exhibit those behaviors. You could say that was so compassionate of you when you made sure the dog had clean water. So you're intentionally introducing that concept. And of course, you can introduce the topic in your everyday life. Watching a movie or reading a book, you can say, do you think that character in the movie was thinking for herself? So again, in the book, we explain why forgiveness in particular, why compassion in particular, and then some examples about how to do that. Okay, the final recommendation related to topic one is to be a positive parent. So, positive parenting is a philosophy of parenting. I believe that it is a way overused term at this point. It does have a very specific meaning coming from three particular seminal authors in the field who created the philosophy of positive parenting. And now if you typed in positive parenting, you'd come, you'd come up with like millions of search results. But I am trying to stay true to the positive parenting philosophy. So there are seven principles that I have uh, identified across all the positive parenting resources that I've read. So the first is to promote a positive attachment. The second is to teach respect by being respectful to your child, being proactive, thinking ahead about what your child needs in a particular situation, engaging in reflective parenting, not just being um, reactive, but thinking, slowing down and thinking, what do I want my child to learn in a particular situation? Using emotion coaching, teaching your child about emotions, being encouraging, and using positive discipline. And I'm picking just two of these to go into a little bit more detail about. Okay, and again, each of these is discussed at length in the book. So I'm just going to focus for a moment on number six, being encouraging. And as noted elsewhere throughout the book, and even in my talk tonight, children need to feel positive regard of their parents. They need to feel that their parents love them, appreciate them, know them, all right? And one specific way to express that is through an attitude of encouragement, conveying to your child that you, their parent, believe in them, know that they are capable of learning and growing into a wonderful, competent person. Children behave better when they feel proud of their accomplishments and feel hopeful that they can do better in the future. The point of encouragement is to help your child develop perseverance in the face of frustration and obstacles so that they don't give up in despair when things don't work out the way they want them to. And I would pause for a moment and say it's really important, I think, for you to be encouraging of yourself and each other, right? And to remember to use what's called positive self-talk when you're navigating your parental alienation experience. So rather than saying, this is the worst thing that's happened, I can't take it anymore, nothing's going to work, to try to be encouraging of yourself. But that is a bit of a digression because we're talking about being encouraging of children. Encouragement of children builds their confidence and self-esteem, and children who feel happy with themselves are generally better behaved and easier to parent. So some specific aspects of encouragement include noticing when the child is feeling proud of themselves and commenting on their internal sense of satisfaction. So rather than you evaluating the child, you're noticing their own organic, authentic pride. So you might say to your child, you seem so proud of yourself for pulling your grade up. So you're not saying I'm proud of you. You're telling you're noticing your child's pride. This creates a feeling also of closeness and connection when you're noticing what your child is feeling, all right? And it involves emotion coaching, which is number five, because you're labeling the child's emotions. Make sure when you do this that you focus on the child's effort, not the outcome. So you would say, I see you're working so hard to build that tower. That's what I call stick-to-itiveness, rather than what a great tower you built. 
Another aspect of being encouraging is to focus on learning as a process rather than an outcome. If your child is trying to accomplish something and it's not going well, you can offer supportive statements. What a good start. Next time it will probably go better. Or you're playing the piano piece better each time. Then, of course, you can share a time when it took you a while to learn something. Showing interest in your child's process and efforts also keeps the focus away from just an outcome. For example, if the child is drawing a picture, instead of saying that it's good or nice or pretty, you can invite your child to tell you about the picture. What parts came out the way you hoped? What parts do you want to keep working on? Likewise, you can ask your child which types of math problems they enjoy or what led them to choose a particular sport. So it's being interested in their thought process. Make sure to convey to your child that mistakes are opportunities to learn as opposed to expressions of defeat and failure. So you're trying to build resilience in your child through being encouraging. If your child doesn't achieve the grade that they're hoping for in a test, you can go over the problems together to see what they need to work on some more. You want to convey that there's usually a way to learn something from a mistake that will help them do better next time. And if it's not completely obvious, these this might seem pretty basic to be encouraging, but it's the kind of thing that really helps a child feel good about the parent-child relationship. And that's why it shores up the positive aspects of the relationship. It makes it harder. Everything you do that's a positive makes it harder for the alienation lie to take hold in the child. So as noted earlier, you want to avoid shaming the child for making a mistake because then they might decide, you know, something isn't worth trying, um, you know, that they don't want to try new and challenging things. Okay. I want to comment on for a moment on the seventh element of positive parenting, which is using positive discipline. Disciplining your hard child can be very challenging. Many of my clients talk about how they don't have parental authority because any kind of discipline they impose is undermined or undone by the other parent. And what makes this, I think, so hard is that many parents take seriously their role as guardians and shapers of their child's moral compass. And they want to ensure that their children can function in the real world. They know how to be polite. They know how to be cooperative. They know how to share. They know how to do what they said they're going to do. In addition, many targeted parents find it galling when their child is uncooperative and they want to make sure that their child learns the right lesson. It's not okay to do that. However, being a targeted parent does change the dynamics. And I think you will be well served if you accept that. At least to some degree, you cannot parent the way you would otherwise. So if you can remind yourself of your twin goals of enhancing the attachment and avoiding taking the bait, you will be off to a good start. In general, I believe in considering a child's uncooperativeness as an indicator that something is not working right and an opportunity to problem solve together, rather than a, a sign that your child is bad, spoiled, abusive, toxic, out of control, oppositional. Let's take an example. Let's say your child borrowed your sweater and returned it dirty. You can politely ask your child to clean it. You can say, I would appreciate it if you return my sweater clean. Thank you so much. There is no need to shame your child by telling them that they're lazy or inconsiderate. Of course, you will want to explain to your child, what do you mean by returning the sweater clean? Does that mean having taken it to the dry cleaners? Does that mean wash, dried, and folded? And of course, you need to make sure your child knows how to do those things. You're working with your child to help them achieve success. Now, let's say that you've done all of those things and your child still returns your sweater dirty. Then you can say, I can see that my sweater is being returned dirty. You can clean it now or I may not want to loan you a sweater next time. It's your choice. There is no need to tell the child you've lost the privilege of borrowing my clothes because that phrase is shaming, blaming, and punitive. And of course, tone of voice really matters. I spend a lot of time in my individual coaching sessions helping parents imagine what their tone of voice sounds like to their children. You don't want to sound snarky or sarcastic. 
or as if you're frustrated with, disappointed in, or uh, you know, disgusted by, or don't like your child. When children hear that tone of voice, they feel demoralized. And they are not pleasant to be around when they feel demoralized, and they may become even harder to parent. So if it isn't obvious, all of these things, all this, everything I've set up until now, the goal is to make the children less hurt, angry, rejecting, and distant. Okay, now I'm going to turn to the second part of the book and second part of the workshop tonight, which is communicating with your child by text. So this is relevant whether your only communication is by text or you still have in-person contact as well. Your child is going back and forth and you might be texting them when they're with the other parent. So in the book, this topic is broken down into five sections. How and why to communicate by text, basic messaging techniques, messaging tips and considerations, 30 types of messages with about 20 examples of each. So there's a lot, hundreds of specific text messaging examples in the book. And then responding to the responses. That is, you might send a message and your child might respond back. What do you do then? Okay, so let's talk about how and why to text. So that's a question. Why should I bother texting my child? Especially this is relevant when my child doesn't bother responding. And many targeted parents talk about looking at their phone, opening up the messaging functioning, and seeing a unbroken stream of text messages on the right side of the screen, you know, let's say in blue that they've sent to the child, and there's nothing on the left side, the child is not responding. So the short answer to that question, or maybe this isn't short, the answer to that question is that even though you and your child have conflict and are distant in, distance in your relationship, and even if your child is not responding back, you are the parent, you are the role model of responsibility, hope, and acceptance in human relationships. Therefore, we believe that you need to make the greater effort in maintaining the relationship during periods of separation. By continuing to send messages, regardless of how your child responds, or maybe they're not responding at all, you are showing your child through your words and actions that you value the relationship, you have love in your heart, and there is always hope for improvement and meaningful connection. Through your life experience, you've probably come to learn that sometimes people have distance and conflict in their relationship, and they can often find a way to work things out that feels right for everyone. You have to carry that knowledge with you in your interactions with your child. And this is a message that's important for you to convey to your child, that you believe the relationship can get better. And one way to do that is by continuing to reach out despite whatever else is going on in the relationship. Now, you may ask, you know, is any one message going to make a difference? And, you know, the answer is probably not. Generally, no one message is going to turn things around. It may be helpful to think of each message as a grain of sand, all right, that you put on one side of the scale. No one grain of sand is going to tip things in your favor, right, unless it's the one final grain of sand that, you know, puts everything over the edge. Most likely, any one message is not going to do that. No one grain of sand can make a difference by itself, just like no one grain of sand can create a beach. But the accumulation of all your messages, like the accumulation of grains of sand on a beach, can create something beautiful and powerful. Taken together, the weight, the force of your love, of your messages, your ongoing and consistent message to your child, that you love them, thinking about them, and holding them close in your heart, can create a receptivity in your child's heart. That's the goal. At the very least, even if it doesn't move the needle, at the very least, you're not reinforcing to your child that you don't care and that you've given up or that you can't even be bothered to text. Right? So at least you're countering the lie. 
And remember, you can never know will be able to predict how many messages or what message will spark a response from your child. If you knew exactly what message would work for which child, you wouldn't need a book with hundreds of possible messages, right? There are probably just too many factors at play, including everything else that's going on in your child's life and in their heart and mind. But from earlier research, we do know that there are many catalysts for a rejecting child coming to the understanding that that rejected parent is not so bad, right? There are many ways to spark or ignite the thought, gee, maybe I should not reject that parent. So we don't know exactly what will lead the child to have that epiphany. And that's why many messages and variation in the message is the way to go. And, you know, we know from our current work with parents who have a hurt, angry, rejecting, distant child, that continued reaching out does make a difference. Sometimes the child will actually say to the formerly cut off parent, you know, all those messages you sent, well, I was actually reading them, even though I never responded. And it is with this understanding that we encourage you and urge you to continue to reach out to your child especially via text messaging, as a meaningful way to show your love and to carry the torch to lead the way toward the light of a closer relationship. Now, I want to give you a couple of um, sort of images or analogies that might be helpful. So one is from a baby book called The Runaway Bunny. If you know me, you know I love this book. Um, it was written and illustrated by the same team that did Goodnight Moon, uh, which is probably better known. But in this book, The Runaway Bunny, the baby bunny imagines scenarios of running away. He says, I'm going to join the circus, or I'm going to become a flower in a hidden garden. I'm going to be a bird that flies away. I'm going to be a boat that sails away. I'm going to be a little boy that runs into a house. And in response, the no mother never gets her feelings hurt. She never gets angry. She always responds with a loving message. She says, well, if you become a bird and fly away from me, I will become a tree that you come home to. So sweet. I love it every time I think about it. She says, if you join the circus and become a trapeze artist, I will become a tightrope walker and I will walk across the air to you. In the end, the little bunny decides he might as well stay and be her little bunny. And this mother has the right idea. She never feels offended or insulted by her child's desire for separation and independence. She maintains an unwavering positive image of her role in her child's life. She never forgets that she's important to him, even while he may forget it. Now, to be fair, in the book, there doesn't seem to be an alienating bunny in another burrow down the hill. So it's a little bit easier for this mother to not get, uh, you know, knocked off her game. But still, she is a role model of a parent in a challenging parent-child situation and a useful image, we think, of the attitude that is required of you when thinking about sending messages. All right. And now an anecdote from a former alienated child, which I also think could be useful here. This was a woman who I interviewed for my first book, Adult Children of Parental Alienation Syndrome, Breaking the Ties of Mind. This was years after her alienation experience. She was an adult, and she told me that when she was much younger, her mother and stepfather prevented her from having a relationship with her father. And she shared that her father, so they lived in England, and instead of the dads getting every other weekend, he got every Sunday. And she shared that her father would drive over every Sunday. He would park his car at the curb. He'd walk up the walkway to the door. He'd knock on the front door. And every Sunday, the mother, stepfather, this woman, when she was a little girl, and her siblings would stand inside the house, just on the other side of the door. They never opened the door. They never answered the door. The girl never got to go out and see her dad. She never had the opportunity to be with him. In fact, she and her siblings would yell through the door, go away, you stupid idiot. We don't want to see you anymore. And eventually, according to this woman, the dad stopped coming. And it's, you know, easy to see why. From his point of view, there was no point. Why should he drive over there and get his hopes up, thinking maybe today will be the day I get to see my kids? 
Why should he walk up to the house and knock on the door only to be rejected and laughed at and mocked and become dejected and disappointed once again? From his point of view, it was a failure. All he got to do was knock on the door. When she was asked, when I asked her, well, what was it like for you when your dad stopped knocking on the door and trying to see you? She said to me she was shocked. She never expected. She couldn't imagine that her rejection, her little girl child rejection of him would actually result in him deciding to stop trying to see her. She explained that from her experience, the knock was the whole point of the visit. She knew she wasn't going to get to see her father. She knew her mom and stepdad weren't going to open the door. There was no way they were going to let her have the visit. From her point of view, the knock was everything because it represented her father's ongoing love for her. The knock was the message. Just like your text message is the message that you love your child and you haven't given up. Well, another way to think about this is sometimes children think or they've been told by an alienator that it's okay to cut off people, right? Oh, you don't like this one? You don't have to, you know, you don't have to see them anymore. They may be getting this message from the other parent, maybe friends, a coach, a spouse if they're grown up and married, a therapist, even maybe from professionals in books and videos. You may be the only person in your child's life who is conveying the message that the relationship has meaning and value despite its problems, that the relationship is worth fighting for. And if you don't reach out, then your child might not be getting that message from anyone. You are the torchbearer for the relationship and perhaps your child's future relationships with significant others. Okay, I know that's kind of heavy. So I'm not going to belabor this. You probably all know this, but in the book, we sort of walk you through different kinds of messages and, um, you know, how and when to use each one. I'm going to just quickly say uh, that there are some tips and considerations, and each of these is elaborated on in the book. I'm just going to highlight a couple. Um, you know, make sure that you don't appear desperate to your child. Like I haven't smiled since the last time I saw you. You want to, um, I'm going to actually go into some detail in number four in a moment, but make sure that you are age appropriate. Your child is growing. Even if you're not, ha you know, having contact with them, you want to make sure that you don't, you know, uh, insult them by offering to do things or, sending them cute pictures or whatever of things that really are way below them developmentally. You want to make sure that you're respectful of all people. You know, kids these days are very open-minded in general about, um, you know, body types and gender orientation and sexual orientation and um, all sorts of isms. And you want to make sure that your messaging, whether it's sending a funny meme or a link to a video or whatever, is not going to um, insult their sensibility. You want to make sure not to embarrass your child. You might find a picture of them with a soggy diaper picking their nose and you might think it's adorable. But if you sent that to your teenage daughter and she opened it at the lunch table and other people saw it, you basically, you know, have committed like social, you know, social media death for your child. So you don't want to do that. Make sure you know your child. If she hates sushi, don't invite her out for sushi. And don't discuss the problems that you're having in the relationship is being caused by somebody else because that is insulting. Um, I want to talk a little bit in detail about number four, make genuine and clear offers. So we do talk in the book about how it is okay to offer to buy your child something or to give your child something, to hand down something, or maybe to pass on. Maybe you have a family member who gave you a birthday gift to give to the child. And you might want to let them know in the text, hey, grandma dropped off some money for you. So Make sure when you message your child with some offer that you're very clear about whether there are strings attached or not, because you don't want to be perceived as being manipulative. So if you say to your child, 
um, I have, you know, I'm ready to pass down my car. Would you like it? And the child says, yes, please. And then you're like, fine, you need to have dinner with me once a month. So that's not um, going to help you rebuild trust with your child. I think there are times when it's appropriate to have strings attached, right? Like, I'm happy to pay for your college as long as you have dinner with me once a month and we're working on our relationship. Um, I'm not, I, I need to know the specific situation, but I want to be clear. I'm not saying that conditions are in and of themselves a bad thing. But you want to make sure that you're clear up front about whether there are conditions or not. And so you don't want to um, add it after the fact. And you do want to be clear if that's sort of a rap that, you know, a complaint that your kids are always saying that you are, um, you know, you're too self-serving or everything you do is conditional. You know, you never just give from the heart you might want to be mindful of not giving a conditional gift. Okay, there are some additional considerations about um, text messaging. You know, make sure that there's nothing sexualized or romantic. You know, two people walking in the sunset, you don't want to send that kind of picture to your child. You want to make sure that you don't look sad or forlorn. You might send a photograph of yourself, you know, waving from the, you know, a beautiful vista, but look at it. How do your eyes look? Are you, do you look really sad? That's going to be perceived as manipulative to your child. Um, avoid inducing guilt. You know, if only you had done this or if only you had done that. Avoid self-serving statements. I've always been there for you. That seems to be a, a popular one. And I, it just, I just don't think it sits well with kids. You might say, I would like to be there for you. It's fine to offer some idea, but you don't, I don't know that you get to say that you've always been there for somebody else. You might say, I hope you feel that I've been there for you. Um, point six, you want, it's sort of, it's a two-edged sword. You don't want to look too happy, you know, like here I am jet skiing in Hawaii. So long suckers, right? Like that's not going to go over well. But like I said, you also don't want to look like you're falling apart um, without your child. And seven, don't make promises you can't deliver on um, just to sort of get your child's attention that's going to um, erode the trust. Okay, I'm moving on to topic three. And um, this is about how to write a letter to an adult child. And I've given other talks about this. So I might not go into as much detail, and I want to preface all of this by saying a couple of things. The first is, in one of my earlier books, Surviving Parental Alienation, there is my initial thinking about how a parent could write a letter to an adult child. And I stand by what that is, but I have found over the years that people will follow that, but it wasn't... I don't think we provided enough concrete examples and guidance. So I would say if you're going to write a letter to an adult alienated child, I would say this book is a better um, a better way to do it because there's way, 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 way more information. But I will also say I have found that even people have read this book or they heard a podcast where I sort of walk people through a lot of it. And they wrote a letter, and it still wasn't quite as deep and um, deeply immersed in the child's perspective as I believe it needs to be. So I do think at the end of the day, you can read the book and follow it, but consider it a draft and still have a session. It doesn't have to be me, but I do do it with somebody to help you really consider how to make it the best possible letter. Okay, um, so if your hurt, angry, rejecting, distant child is over 18 and texting has not yet generated a significant improvement in the relationship, then it is time to start thinking about writing a letter. Unless, of course, there's a temporary or permanent, whatever, restraining order preventing you from having contact with your child. I do believe the letter is best when it is sent to a child who's living away from home. If they're still living with, you know, let's say it's April 
and you know in uh, August your child, you know your child's living at home. It's April senior year. August, you know they're going to college. Wait, wait till they get to college. If they're going to college away from home, um, because the physical and geographic distance from the alienator, I think, does increase the receptivity of the letter. Okay. Um, so the letter is designed to be written from a parent. So even though I work with people on the letter, it still just comes from them. I think that's a little different than how other people do it. Like Josh Coleman, I believe, actually writes a letter from him to the child. That's not the way that I do it. Um, and it is designed to be written, sent from the parent to an adult child. It would need some modification if you wanted to write it to a daughter-in-law or son-in-law. I have worked with people for whom they're cut off from their adult child, but primarily the contact is with us. It might even work if you wanted to write this to a friend or a sibling, but the version that I'm presenting here is the version of parent to child. So this part of the book focuses on the philosophy of the letter, the homework, the components of the letter, and three possible responses from the child and what to do. Um, and it is primarily relevant for situations in which there is a total or near total cutoff with the hurt, angry, rejecting, distant child. Okay, I'm going to talk about the philosophy of the letter and what I normally do when I'm doing a one on one session is I invite the parents, I can invite you to do this too, to close your eyes for a moment and take a deep breath. I'm going to do the same thing. And that calms the central nervous system down. It gets us to a more receptive place. And you want to, if you want to, you can keep your eyes closed. And you can imagine that you're standing on the bank of a river. And it's a turbulent river. The water is churning. And your adult child is all the way on the other side of the river. And the river itself represents all the hurt and anger that lies between you and your hurt, angry, rejecting, distant child. And if you're like many other parents of a hard child, you have done numerous things over the years to reach out to them. Perhaps you pleaded with them to understand there are two sides to every story. Let me just explain. I didn't really do X or I did X, but I didn't do it for the reason you think I did. Right. Maybe you've said to your child, I'm sorry for anything or everything that you think I did or could have done to hurt you. But usually when people come to me with an adult child, they're still cut off from whatever they've done so far hasn't worked. And I'm generally not surprised. Because telling your adult child, you need to know my side of the story, it's like kind of screaming into the wind. I think that in general, people live from their own perspective. And it's hard enough to think about somebody's perspective when you're highly motivated to. But an adult alienated child is generally not motivated, or else they'd be back in your life, to try to think about things from your perspective. So telling them, you need to hear my side of the story. I didn't do what you think I did. Doesn't work. It's like yelling into the wind. Your voice just gets drowned out by the rushing sound of the water and air. If your child's cut you off, they're hurt and angry, and they're not motivated to do the hard work of trying to see things from your perspective. So as an alternative, we offer this method for writing a letter which in keeping with the metaphor of the river involves you, the parent, building a bridge, walking across that bridge and standing next to your adult son or daughter and looking back at the relationship from their point of view. That's why point one says you're going to focus on the child's perspective. Now, I have done this little talk and I do it with my clients and now it's in the book. I have done it so many times, I can anticipate three worries. And so I'm going to tell you what you might be worried about when you hear me say that you need to focus on your child's perspective. 
And then I'm going to tell you my response to those worries. Okay. So in thinking about this idea of building a bridge and walking across that bridge and standing next to your child, looking back at the childhood from their point of view, you're on the other side of the river. There are three things you might be worried about. Why should I apologize for something I didn't do? Or I already tried that and it didn't work. Or I'm the victim here. Why should I be chasing my child? And I understand each of these concerns. And so I'm going to address them. And you might be thinking, oh, I'm not, I don't even have that concern. But I want to tell you my response because that concern might be in the back of your mind. And so I want you to hear what I have to say about it. And then you can maybe draw on that if you do end up having that concern. So the first is, at no point does the letter involve you apologizing for something you did not do. Sometimes parents with an adult hard child get trapped in a binary thought process that says you either prove you didn't do it, you prove you're innocent, or you apologize for something you did not do. And, or you, the kid thinks you did, but you don't. So you have to admit you're guilty, even though you don't think you're guilty. And I really want to assure you, there is a different way to proceed that involves acknowledging your child's perspective without agreeing or arguing the facts. And I'm going to give you what I hope is a very powerful example of that. The, the second concern that you might have is that you've already written a letter like the one recommended here. It's in my book now. It's in the back of that other book. Oh, you tried it. It didn't work. So why bother trying it again? And I think it's possible, but not likely. Because so many times people have come to me and they said, oh, Amy, I heard your talk. I did the letter. And then they send it to me. And for whatever reason, it doesn't really work. And the reason the letter doesn't work in my, my experience is that it's very hard to stay rooted in the other person's perspective. So the person might start their letter with, you know, I understand you think I did blah, blah, but let me just tell you my side of the story. And they just instantly go back to their side of the river. So I think it's very hard to embody the philosophy of the letter. And when I work with somebody who's already written a letter, but they agree to let me do it with them, there's usually this really powerful moment where the person either starts crying or just saying, oh my God, now I see it. So I do think that there's um, something to be said for doing it with somebody else. Okay. Um, so, so while it's possible that you've already written a letter exactly like what I'm recommending, it's more likely that the previous letters have not quite followed the approach, the spirit of what's recommended here. Um, and that's because it's very hard to stay true to the philosophy and intent as I envision it. The letter requires that you avoid inserting your perspective, explanations, justifications, etc. And again, that's very hard to do. We want to explain our thought process. So I do recommend that you write the letter with a mental health professional um, or trusted friend familiar with the proposed approach to help you stay on the other side of the river. The last thing that you want to do is send a letter that inadvertently reinforces the negative idea of who you are. Okay, the third concern that you might have is that it's unfair for you to have to write a letter to do this really hard work. And when I work with people, it's hard. The homework is hard. The letter is hard. It's very challenging. And I want you to know that I understand that you do feel it's unfair. You've been maligned. You've been mistreated. You lost precious time with your child. And now you have to do this hard task. And it's true. No one should have to write the letter unless they want to. So that's something to be clear about. Nobody has to do this. But there are three reasons, I believe, why you, the parent, may choose to write the letter, even though it's unfair. First, you're the parent, and parents generally have to make the greater effort in the parent-child relationship because that's just the nature of the parent-child relationship. 
Second, you are older and wiser and have more life experience, so it's fitting for you to do this work. And third, you are the person who is most in touch with the desire to repair the relationship. So the research I've done and the work I've done coaching show me strongly support the belief that most adult children, even those who are very hurt, angry, rejecting, and distant, want a relationship with a parent whom they have rejected. That means that your adult children want a relationship with you. However, that desire is kind of buried. It's like in a box, it's in a box, it's in a box, it's in a box, it's in the back of the shelf. You know, especially if they're like off in college or they're young adults and they're, you know, they're living their lives. They're not necessarily thinking, I miss my mom or dad, the way you, the parents, are feeling it. Between the two of you, you and your adult child, you are the person who is more aware of and filled with yearning to improve your relationship with your child. You are more aware of the pain, the desire to have a better relationship. Therefore, it makes sense that you would be the one to take the step and write the letter. Um, so again, I want to reiterate that even when a child is rejecting a parent, that child wants a relationship with a parent they are rejecting. And that is that came out very clearly in the research that I did, um, you know, with the, the interviews I did with the adults who rejected a child. They were very cruel to that parent. They wrote letters, you know, drop dead, go away. I don't want you. You don't matter to me. You know, they hung up with them on the phone, whatever. But inside, they revealed to me that despite their presentation of extreme and utter lack of investment in the relationship, that that was false and that underneath they wanted that relationship. So we want you to hold on to that belief that most likely your child wants a relationship with you but they're not necessarily living every day yearning for it the way you are, right? So we believe that it's your job as the parent to honor the relationship, to know that it's important, even while other people may be telling you that the relationship doesn't matter. All right, so returning to this notion of the bridge, we want to be clear that this bridge that you're going to be building is forged from the love that you have for your child and the belief that they still love you, even if they can't admit it right now. You make this effort with love and compassion, no resentment in your heart, and no demand or expectation for an apology. Maybe that comes at some point, but not always. It's not an expectation that the child understands the other parent the same way that you do. This is a, an important idea I want to convey, even for the kids who come around and say, now I get it. This parent turned me against that parent. I lost all this precious time with this parent I cut off. I hurt that parent's feelings. I broke their heart. I feel terrible. But... I still want a relationship with that other parent who did this to me. There may never be a fully shared understanding of who that other parent is, why they did what they did, or whether the child should want to have a relationship with them. At the same time, the letter does not involve groveling and inconsiderate. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry that I don't believe in that. There's another way to respond to your child's hurt, anger, rejection, and distance. So I'm now returning to this idea that there is another space, something that neither demands your child sees things from your point of view, proving you're innocent, nor agrees with your child's false narrative, admitting you're guilty. And the way that I'm going to convey this to you is by telling you the story of a former client. This was a mom. She came to me telling me that she had a son who was an adult and she believed that they were alienated from each other. 
She shared that when her son was about seven years old and she was already divorced, she asked the father if she could move away with the son hundreds of miles away. And according to her, he agreed. So she sold her house, she quit her job, and she got a new house and a new job several states away. The day before she was set to move, the father filed an emergency motion preventing her from taking the boy with her. And she lost at the hearing and she moved anyway because she didn't want to lose her new house and job. And she hoped that she would win at the trial, but she did. So she was never the primary caregiver again. And according to her, she and her son eventually became alienated from each other. And by the time she came to me, she had already reached out to her son. She had written him several letters explaining that it wasn't her fault that she lived so far away. She shared that the father had tricked her into moving away and that she had suffered from missing her son. And I'm not surprised her efforts did not succeed in repairing the relationship because she was basically telling him that he was wrong or stupid or bad for feeling the way he felt. So I helped her write a letter. And in that letter, there was one paragraph that addressed this issue of her moving away. I talked about it at length with the mother. She was clear. She didn't want to grovel. She didn't want to concede that she had abandoned her son, even though he had accused her of that. But we had decided together that it doesn't make sense for her to argue with her son and tell him he's wrong. So this is, I'm going to paraphrase the paragraph that she and I came up with. I imagine that you are hurt and angry with me because I moved 500 miles away. You were just a little boy of seven years of age. You were used to seeing your mom and dad every week. And then all of a sudden, your mom was an airplane ride away, and you only saw me on holidays and summers. What a big change for such a little boy. So at this point in the paragraph, she's writing about the experience from the child's point of view. She's showing him boy, I'm really trying to think about what that was like for you. Then she continued in the paragraph by asking questions, not to make him justify his feelings. Like, isn't it true I always sent a, you know, a, a plane ticket for you? Didn't we have fun when you came to visit? Not that kind of uh, question to make, um, to sort of show that he's wrong for having feelings that he had but to show deep interest in his felt experience, what I refer to as compassionate curiosity. She's interested because she cares. So she asked him, what was that like for you? Were there times when you missed me and needed me to be there for you and I wasn't? Did other kids tease you because they lived with their moms and you didn't? Did you feel that if I really loved you, I would not have moved away? No. This is very hard for the targeted parent to do because there's a fear that many targeted parents have that if you go there, if you go into the child's pain and you sit there in the child's womb, that you're making it worse and that the kid will say, well, I wasn't really mad before, but now I'm furious. It doesn't work that way. When you show your child that you can tolerate their pain, that you're interested in their emotional wounds, the wounds heal. All right. And then she ended the paragraph with the wish about something she could have done differently. And what we came up with was, I wish I had worked harder at the time what it felt like for you when I moved away. And it is my belief that healing can occur because this mother made the effort to understand her child's lived experience. And she demonstrated deep interest in what happened to him. So by asking these types of questions, the mother was showing her son that she could tolerate his perspective and wanted to hold his pain. So it's a very, very powerful moment in the letter writing process. When the parent comes to this space and they don't want to go there, and then they allow themselves to open their heart and think, wow, what was that like for my child? And then the paragraph and the letter becomes very powerful and I think very healing. It has a lot of positive responses from the kids 
Not every child responds, but enough do that I do feel very strongly that this is one one way to go. There might be other ways, but this way seems to be a good way. So I'm going to rely on Cindy, who's on our call, to um, tell me when it's time to stop, because I do believe that I'm pretty much at the end of my time. So I'm going to talk for a minute or two more, just to say that there is homework. Um, It's spelled out in the book, and I do it in my coaching. The homework is designed to activate, to begin to activate your insight and empathy for your child's perspective. It's not the be all and end all, it's a starting point for writing the letter. And then in the book, and I'm not going to go through it now, there are 10 paragraphs. Each paragraph is explained in the book and again in the coaching. And I say here, you can consult the book and notice and work with a knowledgeable professional. I do encourage you to manage your expectations. Lots of kids respond positively to the letter, but not everyone. Sometimes the letter might not even be read. And then in the book, again, I go through what do you do if you don't get a response? What do you do if you get an angry response, which I consider a good thing since the child doesn't have to bother responding at all? And what do you do if you get a positive response? Gee, mom or dad, thanks for that letter. That meant a lot to me. All right. In closing, thank you to Cindy and ISNAF for the opportunity to discuss these topics with you all. I certainly hope it was helpful and I look forward to hearing the questions. Thank you, Amy. A wonderful presentation. And as I stated before to everyone, you heard a brief summary of so many important factors in communicating with our children on multiple levels. So I'm just going to invite everybody, Ron, don't walk, go to Amazon, get the book. So let's go to our questions. The first question we have is, how often do you suggest texting, calling a teenager living with the other parent if they are refusing to spend the night? This parent does, I know this parent and they do have contact with the child. Right. So I will say I'm happy to answer that question, but there might be something specific about that, your particular situation that would make my comments, my response not the best one for your particular situation. But in general, I recommend texting every day. And I think that that's kind of hard for people of, you know, people who are parents now, we didn't grow up with cell phones. We didn't grow up with texting. A text a day now is nothing for these kids. It's not like I'm being harassed and stalked and overwhelmed with all, you know, inundated with all of these texts. So um, I don't think texting every day would be out of the norm, depending on your specific situation. Okay. And that is something that um, we have worked with, with other professionals inside of our program is um, understanding what is their capacity based on what that relationship is. So I think that parent has some insight into that. Yeah, I would I also add, and I don't think it's relevant for this parent, but for other people listening, if for whatever reason, you don't text your child at all, it might be weird to start texting every day. So you might want to do like every couple of days and then sort of build back up to doing it every day. So I think you have to take where you are and see how to get from where you are to every day in a way that kind of makes sense. Exactly. And that's what we talk about and see what their capacity is, measurement, what they can um, tolerate. Uh, Thank you. So the next question is, what, and you may have covered some of this already, but this some of these questions came in immediately. So what to write in a letter, no phone contact to a 19-year-old she came back last year, uh, then left at 18. Um, so, yes, I would say that going to the book and reading about the letter is probably the best way. There are 10 paragraphs in the letter. Um, each one is explained in detail. And I would say I I have heard many times 
that the kids come back and things get better and then they go away and then they come back. And it's very, very unnerving for the parent to have to go through that. There are these sort of false starts. Um, even when you write the letter and then the kid has a positive response, you might have a phone call and then you might not hear from them for a while. You really are sort of letting your kid take the lead. And you have to sort of accept in a way, sometimes it's two steps forward and one step backward. And there's not much you can do about it, but continue to be steady in your uh, presentation of love to your child. Excellent. So thank you. And I just want to contribute in that um, for everyone else, Karen Woodall, who's been doing learning circles, and I've been training with her as well talks about when the child, and she's reunited over 300 um, children herself. So she says, when the child begins the journey back, they never turn back, but they ping pong. So that's exactly what you're talking about there. And they go back and forth. So continuing that journey and then picking up some tips from Amy on, you know, what do you write? How do you write? How often do you write? Texting, whatever means you have. The other thing I want to share with the group, because you just spoke about writing, is that um, we uh, recommend to parents who are writing to our children that you uh, go on. There's a um, site called MailTrack.com, and it, it's for Gmail. And I don't know if other um, site, uh, there's other uh, resources for other Gmails, but other accounts, let's say other than Gmail. But on MailTrack, it's for Gmail. You can sign up and when, and if you pay a fee, you can track when your child opens your letter and the exact time they open it, how much they open it. And if you don't pay a fee, the child knows that you're tracking them. If you pay a fee and it's a nominal fee, um, and you don't have to sign up for the whole year, you can do like three months at a time. You can see every time they open your letter. And it's important to also track how often they open the same letter. And that kind of shows that they're reattaching and they're um, more susceptible to wanting to hear from you. So I invite everybody to check out that mail track. It's an excellent resource to know if your child get, receives your communication. Would it be inappropriate to send the bunny book to my older teen fully alienated? And with that question, I just would like you to answer the question multiple people have asked through some of the coaching I've done. Is it appropriate to send any of your books uh, to any child, even adult children? What are your thoughts on that? Actually, I would like to just go back to the texting for a moment, and then we'll talk okay. about the books. Um, I think that one of the things I didn't say tonight is that it's really important to have variety in your texting. So you can't just say to yourself, I'm going to text every day. I love you, son, or, you know, I love you, daughter. If that um, isn't going to be, I think, enough to, to spark a feeling in your child. You do, I think it is ideal when you put your heart into your messages and when you put variety whether it's emojis and then memojis and memes and gifs and photographs. And, and that is why we put in the book literally 25 different ways to say, I love you. I think that you don't really know exactly what's going to bing in your child's, you know, receptors in their brain. Like, oh, this parent, maybe this is, maybe there is love here. You don't know exactly whether it's going to be a visual, a, a word puzzle a picture of a puppy, you don't really know what's going to do it. But the variety does undo the lie. Oh, you don't really care. So if you just wrote a text message every day, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, your kid's going to get immune to it. And the other parent might even look and say, Oh, they can't even be bothered to say anything interesting to you. That's so lazy. You know, it's just sort of an automatic I love you, I love you. So yes, you want to say I love you but you want to put a lot of variety and thought into your messaging. And I'm recognizing that it's very hard for the parent who opens their phone and sees that steady stream of blue on the right side of the screen, meaning that all you're doing is sending, 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 and you're not getting anything back. And I just encourage you to try to um, just 
kind of get it in your head that it's a, you know, as Brian Ludmer says, it's a marathon, not a sprint. You might have to send a hundred messages. You don't know. If you can feel good about the effort, thinking about that knock, the knock is what matters, then you'll you won't get too hopefully overwhelmed with feelings of despair and discouragement and hopelessness. Just think, hey, I succeeded. I sent that message. Um, now, in terms of the bunny book, I don't know if it would, what it's going to mean to a child. You know, if you send your 15 year old son a baby book, I don't know how they're going to receive it. Um, you know, maybe you could have the book in your home, you know, um, if your child has no contact with you, it just might seem a little odd to send them a baby book. But I'm not totally opposed to it. Maybe you could put a little note in the front like this mother bunny, you know, I will, you know, try to be there for you in the ways you need me to be. I think that would be fine. I wouldn't say I'm always there for you. You know, that's one of my pet peeves. I just don't like that. It sounds a little too heroic. Um, in terms of sending my books, I don't know how many of you have been on my website, but I have a blog and one of my blogs is no, don't send my book to your adult child. Um, if you do, you're basically standing on your side of the river, yelling into the wind. I think you're alienated. You've been turned against me by the other parent. I really think that's sort of the worst message because you're imposing your vision on to somebody who isn't even asking you, hey, what do you think happened? Then it's fine to maybe say, well, maybe you've been influenced by the other parent. Maybe if you've been asked and only under certain circumstances would you share your perspective. But if you have not been asked, I think you're going to insult them, annoy them, and reinforce the idea that you're really, really out of touch with where they're at. So um, look, if I thought it was that simple, I wouldn't have created the letter, right? I'd say just send them my book. But I really don't think that's going to go over well. I think the point of the book is to help you, the parent, have some insight into what it might feel like to be an alienated child so that you are less angry at your adult alienated child, that you are less unforgiving or frustrated or thinking, boy, they must really be stupid that they, you know, bought that lie, right? How could they be so mean or so easily manipulated? So the, the book is really, if it has a purpose, it's to give you hope that some of these kids come around and to help you be empathic towards the adult child. It, the book is not for the adult child. Thank you for that. And to your point, um, something that I do want to just share with everybody is um, in the world of domestic violence, giving unsolicited advice is considered a form of psychological abuse. So be mindful that just falls right into what you just stated. So next question. Any suggestions what to say to elder, elderly relatives on my side who were w once so close with my teen and she is alienating them now also? And, and before you speak, let me just say, I would like to invite this parent as a new parent to our, our work. Um, any of the presentations we have, you are always welcome to complimentary on your donation. You can invite them to participate as well, other than Karen Woodall's work, because that's um, done separately. But any of the other presentations and meetings we have, including interactive, they are always welcome to participate to understand what your journey is and what the experience is. So the floor is yours, Amy. All right. So I think that for targeted parents, relationships with their family can be very fraught. And there's sort of two, at least two pieces of this. One is there are times when the extended family has not been rejected and they do have a relationship with the alienated kids. And sometimes the parent, let's say I have a client who's, you know, a, a rejected parent, but her family still has access to the kids. Sometimes the parent feels betrayed 
by their own family. Why are you hanging out with my kids when my kids are treating me so badly? In general, I think that it's a good thing if the kids still want to maintain contact with your family, even if they're rejecting you, as long as your family isn't contributing to the alienation. Like, yeah, that parent really is terrible. We don't like them either, right? As long as they're maintaining love for you, they are keeping a connection alive between your child and an extension of you. And so I would say, if you're the targeted parent and your family is still hanging out with your kids, even though that might feel like a betrayal and it might feel hurtful, I think in general, it can be a good thing. So um, because it's exposing your child to people who still love you. You know, there's pictures of you in their home. They might gently once in a while mention you. So I think that that's a good thing, even though it can be very, very painful. Another aspect of the extended family situation is when your family is so mad at the kid for treating you badly that they sort of cut off the kid or create you know, a negative relationship with the kid. And I've seen many situations where the extended family doesn't understand alienation and they start pressuring the parent to set boundaries with the child and stop being a doormat and you need to set limits and don't let your child walk all over you. And I, I have a lot of clients who have conflict with their family because their family wants them to parent as if it's not alienation, when there is alienation. And that then creates friction and a feeling of not being supported. So I would say if you're an extended family of somebody who's going through alienation, take the lead from your you know, family member, the targeted parent, and support them and be loving to them. And don't try to tell them how to parent because you don't really know unless you're in an alienation situation. Then I think there's the situation that you just raised, whoever raised the question, which is how do you as the targeted parent help your extended family who are now being rejected? And I think maybe it's helpful to give them the book, Adult Children of Parental Alienation, because they might have some more empathy for the child and some understanding. And I think just acknowledging that it's very, very painful, especially like for the grandparents who love their grandchildren and maybe they're getting older and they're worried about time and losing precious time with their grandkids. It's so sad for the parent to not only lose a relationship with their kids, but see their own family suffering. So I don't have a quick and easy answer for that. I do sometimes have other you know, family members on my coaching calls to hear. Sometimes they have interesting ideas and it helps them to feel like they're being a part of it and doing what they can. Sometimes it's just helping them understand a little bit more of the basics of alienation and how it happens so they feel less, um, you know, despairing and um, just resentful of what's happening. So I don't know if I actually answered the question or not. Cindy, if you want to follow up with some other aspect of that, I'm happy to, you know, keep going on well, this topic. Well, I, I no, I actually, I think you did cover multiple different um, aspects of that. Um, I just want to put out there that consider that they are also going through grief because they're experiencing a loss. And we have had through ISNAF, we have our grief program that we've had now in place for several years. We've had grandparents, significant others, um, aunts, uncles go through that program to understand what they're dealing with through the different five stages of grief. That's the Elizabeth Kubler Ross model and, um, empower themselves to understand. But I think the education, the compassion for them and also, the difficult part for the targeted parent, and I went through this myself, is we're ex experiencing our own loss and our own grief, and then we're having to manage our own, you know, family. And for me, it was my, you know, my parents. Um, with everything you said, Amy, I went through myself and trying to be there for them while I'm inside of my own grief. 
Um, but I did find that as time went on and I began to try to educate them more, that did help. They never did the grief program. I was not in place at the time, but we do offer that. So inviting them in to get educated into these groups, into the support, you know, available to them. Um, when they get into other groups with other parents and in the community, they begin to realize it's not them. And something my own parents used to say was, I don't know what I did wrong. And it was like, you didn't do anything wrong. So um, for them to understand, but they were in their own grief. So um, it's important to, I think, educate and understand their grief. And it's realize that um, as a targeted parent, you're in your own grief. And so sometimes we can't hold that space for them, but do offer them that other, um, those other resources. And ISNAF allows all p parties of the pa families to go through our grief program. And Amy, anything else you have to contribute to that? Well, I guess I would say that, you know, there's kind of a visual that came into my head of when you drop a pebble into a, you know, into water and then the sort of the ripples of, you know, that, that, that permeate out from that, you know, in the center of alienation as a parent and child losing a relationship. And I would actually say the center center of alienation is that is the child losing a piece of themselves. And then there's the parent-child relationship, and then there's all the other people, the aunts and uncles and grandparents and cousins and, you know, step-siblings and step-parents who are losing relationships. So it's really profound. You know, many, many, many people are hurt by the loss of that one, you know, alienated relationship. Yeah, and, and I do want to just speak to that, I think it's an important point because exactly that happened in my own family. Um, it's important to um, not be upset with our family, but to have love and compassion with dignity and do the best you can to understand what they're dealing with and hopefully bring them some knowledge so they can understand what you're dealing with and have that compassion for you as well. Yeah, and I guess I would build on that by saying I encourage people to ask for what they need. I ask you not to bring it up every time we're together, or I ask that you not, um, you know, uh, pressure me to, you know, do something with my child that I don't feel is the right time, or uh, whatever it is you need, you do have a right to ask for it as long as you ask without putting the other person down. So rather than saying to your family, you know, you're doing this wrong, or you're, you're hurting me in this way or that way, just, hey, this is what I need to help me get through this. I need for you to not bring up how my kids are every single time we're together. Or conversely, I need you to ask how my kids are doing. Even you know, I'm not seeing them, but I still want to make sure that you ask that would mean a lot to me. I thank you for that suggestion. Absolutely. So yeah, and, and do it with love and compassion. You know, I had to do that myself. And I learned that tool to just simply say, um, you know what, it's really a difficult topic for me to talk about. So I prefer not to discuss that right now. But it's the it's the um, double bind for them. Because then at Christmas, when nobody asked, it was like, wow, nobody even asked. The kids aren't here and nobody cared. You know, all the cousins, nieces and nephews are here. So we need to be mindful ourselves of what that we're not putting people into double binds as well. And it's OK for your needs to change. Like right now, I need a little break from talking about it. I might feel differently later. Or right now, I really it is important for me to know that you're thinking about my kids, but there might be a time when I need a break from that because our, you know, our needs change. Yep. Okay. So thank you. I think we covered that enough. There's a whole lot more to be said on that topic. Just, you know, join any of our meetings that we have um, in the future for anybody in our interactive meetings and, and or participate in our programs and we can discuss that more. So next question um, she saw me fall apart. We both stepped right into the fear and stress of the other parents' abuse. She broke down and I took her to the hospital for help. And I, and she saw me angry because this classic inciting conflict situation you write about, you can comment on, can you comment on this? 
So the parent broke down, then the child broke down, and she took the child for help. I feel like I would need a more personal conversation with this person to know more about what's going on. Um, okay. I so, just don't know what it means, and I, I'm not sure this is the right setting to know. Yeah, that's an almost a critical part? question. Yeah, I agree. So... I'm going to invite that person um, to write to me personally and um, and see if we can decipher that and if I can get you an answer from a professional who's a clinician, okay? So next person, could the letter be in the form of a video? That's an interesting thought. Um, I don't have an immediate negative response i think you want to follow in my belief is you want to follow all 10 paragraphs um it might be too intense for the person to get that content that content through video and it might be too intense for the person watching i mean you know making the video the parent i guess i would say first work on the letter and then see what you know, what medium makes the most sense. Mostly I have people mail it or email it. And I, and I like that it's in writing because then the person has the person reading it has a little bit of distance. I worry that the targeted parent might be too emotional when they are, um, when they're making the video. So I can't say definitively yes or no, but I can say I'm a little worried about it. Um, and I would want somebody else to watch the video and make sure that it's not too emotionally intense. Okay. I, and I absolutely could see why, because most of us aren't actors. So hiding our... It, you know, um, expression would be difficult versus just being neutral. So I have a, a thank you from a parent. And uh, next we have another question. Can you suggest ways to communicate if channels like chat are blocked? Well, I think it would depend on how old the child is and where they're living. You know, if they have a job, you might be able to find their work email if they're in college. You know, you might be able to find their college email. Most Colleges have the same and same with work, you know, whether it's first name dot last name at blah, blah, dot, whatever, and you might be able to find them that way. If you know where they live, you maybe want to write out the letter and put it in an envelope and leave it for them. Um, that's one of the things I do in the coaching is I try to work with people. First, we write the letter. I, the person might say, there's no way I can never write the, I could, I'm never going to find a way to get the letter to the person. I still think there's value in writing the letter. But usually, there is a way to get the letter to the person. It doesn't have to be through cell phone. You might have an email, you might have somebody who can give it to them. That requires some thought, for sure. Um, but there are some other avenues. Okay, and um, to that point, I just hired a private eye to locate my youngest son, and um, I'd been sending letters to him at his brother's home, not knowing if he was getting it, where I have an address. They're both alienated, though, um, and I hired a private eye. The private eye gave me an address. I sent something certified. He never picked it up. They just sent a another notice, and then he sent me an email address that I had since he was a child. And I tried that email address with MailTrack and he opened it. So much to my surprise. So there's, you know, other means in which to find, but don't give up. Just, just stay in an inquiry. There's a, there's always, if there's a will, there's a way. Get on a one of our meetings and other parents will talk about other means that they've used to make connections. So next question, I do have a question um, that's a social media question that I'm going to um, stay away from because it's an opinion and I'm not going to offer that right now, but I will offer that person if you want to write to me about that, um, I will be happy to give me give you some insight into that. Um, this is another question. My 13-year-old son, currently equal custody, says he wants to move with his father to live with his father's girlfriend an hour away in another state. He insists that he is not like most kids are. 
doesn't need to have equal time with both parents, says he will visit me when he has time, but his dad keeps him extremely busy. How do I communicate with him about why my answer is no? Um, I have some thoughts. And again, I'm just going to, I don't mean to be a broken record, but I will qualify it, which is if we were in a coaching session, I would know more and something you said might change what I'm going to say now. But just taking that scenario, I would say the main phrase that I encourage parents to share with their child is, or there's a couple here. One is um, kids do best when the parents make the schedule. Um, that's actually, I'll just leave it at that. So that's something that I encourage parents to say. So I don't think you should be communicating with him about why your answer is no. I think sort of the problem is in the question because it's an assumption that you should be having a conversation with your child. And I don't think that um, much good is going to come out of that. I think your position should be kids do, I believe, this is you talking, I believe kids do best when they have relationships with both parents and spend a lot of time with both parents. I think that's true for you, even though you feel that you're not like most kids in other ways. I think this is still true for you. And I believe that kids do best when parents stick to the schedule. And that's it. I think that's frustrating for the child because the other parent, my father, or I don't know if you're the mom or the dad, you know, but, you know, my other parent trusts me to let me make decisions or that parent trusts me and tells me everything that's going on. And it's hard to just stick to the, you know, this is what I believe. I think it's better for us to keep with the schedule. And I think that anything more than that is going to get you into trouble. Excellent. And uh, something I'd like to point out with that answer, Amy, which I um, also see um, is that we want to hold, you know, healthy boundaries and you want to hold your place in the hierarchy of the family system and not have the child becoming above you. And that's uh, as Amy, as Karen Woodall talks about in her work is um, that getting the family system back into alignment um, is important. So right. last I question. I just want to add, Cindy, I'm sorry. I just want Go to ahead. elaborate on one thing. This is one of those examples where tone of voice really matters. Because if your kid is, you know, pushing you and pushing you and you start to feel stressed, it's possible that you might say something, even my phrase, I believe kids do better when we stick to the schedule, could come across as snarky or harsh. So you want to make sure that you acknowledge I understand that you're frustrated. I understand that you want to have a deeper discussion with me. And, not but, and I believe kids do best when parents make scheduling decisions. So you need to make sure that you are acknowledging that you're saying something that might be frustrating for your child. Yeah, again, love, compassion with dignity. And holding your space in that. So excellent. So yeah, like what you suggested, make sure you get somebody to review that for you who has some null insight into what that's going to occur like for the child. So this will be our last question. Then we're going to be, we have to close the call. We have several other questions and I'm sorry we can't get to them all, but excellent questions. Thank you all for, for, for posting those. Um, the last question is, do you suggest emailing a letter instead of sending a physical letter to a 16-year-old living with the other parent or just continue to visit periodically and text, FaceTime, and call? Well, I don't know if those are, I'm not sure this is an either or. Like, I don't think you should be sending the letter. You might send a letter, but I don't think you should do the letter with the 16-year-old who's living full-time with the other parent. The child is too young, and they're still fully immersed in the life of, you know, that other parent. So the letter is really for an adult alienated child, even if they're 18, you know, just on the on that beginning side of being an adult. But if they're an adult in college, an adult living away from home, that is the ideal scenario for the letter. That doesn't mean you can't send letters. It just shouldn't be the letter. I don't think it should be the letter that I'm talking about with the 10 paragraphs. 
Um, but there also might be other things you can do um, in addition to visiting and texting that it could be a brainstorming conversation we could have or you could have with somebody else about what else you could be doing. So I'm not sure the choices are letter or just visits and texts. Um, I hope that was helpful. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I know that parent actually has worked with you as well. So um, I'm sure she'll be working, reaching out. I've worked with her as well. So um, and just to that, I think um, that whatever means we have available, we should use every media possible and even social media if we post, if anybody has anything you post um, um, on that. And to that, I know, Amy, several years ago, you re recommended to me with no contact with my young children using social media. Can I ask you very quickly to talk about that for a moment? Well, I'm sorry, Cindy, but I don't actually remember what I specifically suggested to you about social media. But yes, I think we do want to be creative. And um, as you said, use a variety of methods that we have available. You do need to be mindful of all of those um, you know, tips and considerations. You don't want to embarrass your child. You shouldn't be posting you know, pictures of them in soggy diapers picking their nose, you know, on Facebook, you can't do anything that should that's self serving, you know, I did everything for my child, but I still haven't seen them, you don't want to be manipulative, etc. So I'm not that uh, focused on what the medium is, I'm more focused on the message that it follows those, the, the spirit and the guidelines that we put out in the book so that you don't do something that makes things worse. If you embarrass or insult your child, you're just reinforcing the lie and it's going to make everything harder. Amy, thank you so much for presenting to our group. We're really grateful that you were willing to do that right after you um, published your book. And I know you've had your um, um, other challenges. Um, do visit our YouTube channel. We do have Amy Baker's presentation from last year on letter writing and how to speak to your children that's on our youtube channel so you can go there and you can stop it and take notes and do whatever you need we have multiple other professionals it's our intention to upon the professionals agreement to post to our youtube channel so we can carry forward this message and you can continue to access it at any time so with that i'm going to close with a quote which we like to leave everybody with and that is um don't confuse your path with your destination just because it's stormy now doesn't mean you aren't headed for sunshine. So I know all of you are on a journey. It's very challenging. Do take care of yourself. We're upon the holidays. Do enjoy your holidays. Continue your traditions. Reach out to your children. Continue to love them with love and compassion and dignity. And still enjoy your life and do your work. And you're not the ones I need to talk to because you're all here on a Sunday night. So with that, I want to say happy holidays. I hope to see you all next uh, week for Karen Woodall's call. And Amy, thank you so much. We are so grateful for all of your work, not just tonight. So thank you again.